Hi everyone, in this video we're going to talk about um, a little bit more about what a derivative can tell us about the behavior and shape of a function. So let's begin by recalling that if we know that f of x is strictly greater than zero on some interval, then we know that the function f of x is increasing on the interval, right? If the derivative is positive, that corresponds to increasing functions on the interval. And if f prime of x is strictly less than zero on some interval, then what can we say about f of x? It has to be decreasing, right? And so visually, if we draw our favorite parabola-looking graph, we know that we are decreasing as we move from left to right. What does it mean to decrease? As you move from left to right, the function values are going down, right? And that, of course, corresponds to negative slopes for the tangent lines. On the right-hand side of this little parabola-looking thing, the function's increasing, because as we move from left to right, what are the function values doing? They're getting bigger, yeah? And increasing function values, of course, corresponds to positive slopes of the tangent lines. Yeah? And we know this. This isn't anything new. So let's just work a little example together to get the brain juices flowing a little bit. Yeah? Example. Find the intervals on which f of theta, that's a theta, <laughs> equals to 2 cosine theta minus cosine of 2 theta is increasing and decreasing on the closed interval from 0 to 2 pi. My handwriting got a little bad here. I apologize. Yeah. Uh, that is f of theta equals 2 cosine of theta minus cosine of 2 theta. Yeah. So pause the video. Try to solve this problem yourself. You know how to do it. So give it a shot. All right. So if we want to find intervals on which we are increasing and decreasing, we certainly know that that means that we need to solve for where f prime of x is bigger than 0, and where f prime of x is less than 0, right? So first step is going to be to find f prime. Now we're not x here, but theta. Um, but we need to find the derivative. And then we need to set it less, uh, greater than 0 and less than 0. And that means that we need to solve an inequality. And we're going to use those sign charts from pre-calculus. And again, we've seen this before. This is hopefully just a nice review. So let's take a derivative. What's f prime of theta? Well, it's going to be negative 2 times the sine of theta plus 2 times the sine of 2 theta. Yeah? And what we really want to do is now find where this thing is greater than 0 or less than 0. So how do we do the number line? Remember, we need to plot the roots or asymptotes, or anywhere that is not defined, and then test points on either side of the roots. So how do we solve for where this function, negative 2 times the sine of theta plus 2 sine of 2 theta equals 0? How do we solve this equation? Well, we need some trig identities, right? I know that the sine of 2 theta is 2 times sine theta cosine theta. So we're going to use that. So it's minus 2 sine theta. I'm going to use the double angle identity here to get 4 sine theta cosine theta equals 0. Okay. So now I have a common factor. I see um, a negative 2 sine theta, and I can factor out a negative 2 sine theta here. So let's do that. So we get negative 2 sine of theta times what's left over. I see 1 minus 2 cosine theta equals 0. So what are my solutions in this interval? Well, I must have that sine of theta 
is equal to 0 by setting this first factor equal to 0. And I must have that by setting the second factor equal to 0, cosine of theta is equal to positive 1 half. What are the solutions in the closed bounded interval from 0 to 2 pi? For the first equation, we see that we get theta equals to 0 pi 2 pi. And for the second equation, here's my cat. You're, you're a good cat. For the second equation, where does cosine of theta equal 1 half? That's at theta equals pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3. Yeah. So these are our three roots. So what do we do now? With these roots, we make a number line. And I only need to consider a closed bounded number line, right? So this endpoint on the left is 0. This endpoint on the right is 2 pi. Yeah. And now I plot, uh, here's like pi over 3. Here is pi. And here is 5 pi over 3. And testing points on each of these intervals, we see that the signs, the SIGN signs, are positive, negative, positive, negative. Yeah? So where are we increasing? We know that we're increasing wherever we see positive values of the derivative, right? And remember, the function into which we test here is the derivative. We test our points in the derivative. So if we get a plus sign, that means the derivative is positive, which means the function is increasing. But an, a great natural question is, what about the endpoints? Let's really think about what happens on endpoints. I'm going to scroll up a little bit here. What do we do with the endpoints? Let's draw our little parabola guy again. Let's call this the point A. That bottom, let's say the bo it bottoms out at some x value b and then finishes over at c. Where is this function increasing? I know the sign chart, if I did the same sign chart here, I have, I, I'm decreasing here, so if I plugged in a value into the derivative, I get a minus sign. If I plugged in a value into the derivative of this little parabola guy on the right hand side, I get a plus. I get a positive value, right? But really, I'm decreasing on the closed interval from A to B, aren't I? Why does this make sense? Remember, what does it mean to act? What does it actually mean to decrease? It means that for every value, every two values that you pick in this interval, the one on the right has a lower function value. So if I pick, worst case scenario, the endpoints, the one on the right is lower than the one on the left. And that's true for any pair of values that I pick between A and B. And so it seems kind of strange, but we're also increasing on the closed interval from B to C. We're also increasing on a closed interval from B to C. Because for every two points that I pick on the, on the closed interval B to C over here, the one on the right is always bigger than the one on the left. Yeah. So in general, the rule of thumb, here's my cat again, <laughs> the rule of thumb is that, let me get her out, so in general, the rule of thumb is that include the endpoints. if f of x is continuous at the endpoints. Yeah? Include the endpoints if the function is continuous there. So with that, what are the intervals on which we are increasing in our, back to our problem up here? We're increasing from 0 to pi over 3. And we're increasing from pi to 5 pi over 3. And we're including the endpoints because our function is nice and continuous. Where are we decreasing? We're decreasing from pi over 3 to pi, and from 5 pi over 3 to 2 pi.
Not so bad. Let's do another problem. There we go. All right. So let's draw a little picture again. We know that if we have a parabola looking thing, to the left of that minimum, we have a decreasing function. To the right of that minimum, we have an increasing function. What is the sign, the SIGN sign of f prime of x do to the left of where it hits the minimum here? It's negative. The derivative is negative. To the right, the derivative is positive, right? So the derivative switches from negative to positive if you have a minimum. What happens if our function maybe looks like this? So it's not going to be differentiable, but we know that this is a critical point, right? This is a point at which the derivative does not exist, but it's nice and continuous, yeah? What is our derivative? What do our, the signs of our derivative do? They switch from positive to negative. The slopes of the tangent lines go from positive to negative. Visually, the function switches from an increasing function to a decreasing function. If we go from positive to negative slopes, what does that mean about what happens where they transition? It has to be a local maximum. So if we go from negative to positive, you have to have a local minimum. If you go from positive to negative, you have to have a local maximum. This is called the first derivative test. Suppose f of x is continuous and let f of x have a critical point at x equals c. Yeah, suppose we have a critical point at x equals c and we're nice and continuous. One. If f prime of x Changes sign. Oops. Um, from positive to negative, f of x has a local max at x equals c. So we know at x equals c that has to be the location of a local maximum because we switch from an increasing function to a decreasing function. If f prime of x changes sign, oops, spelling is hard, changes sign from negative to positive, then f of x has a local minimum. And that's in our first case here. If we go from a decreasing function to an increasing function, we have to have a local minimum at the point at which we, at the point that we transition. And three, if f prime of x does not change sign, eh, can't spell today, then the point x equals c is neither a local maximum nor a local minimum. When can this happen? When does the derivative not change sign at a critical point? Well, let's draw a picture. Your favorite function, for instance. How about y equals x cubed? Ooh, that's not good. Not that one. Yeah? What happens we know that x equals 0 is a critical point because the derivative is equal to 0, right? If y equals x cubed, y prime is equal to 3x squared. At x equals 0, we certainly have that the derivative is 0, so it is a critical point. But it goes from increasing and then keeps increasing. So it's actually increasing on its entire domain. 
this is neither a minimum nor a maximum, right? It's not the biggest value or, or, on an open neighborhood. It's not the smallest value. Yeah. This could also happen if you had a maybe negative x cubed, something like this, right? If it goes from decreasing to decreasing, or a negative derivative to a negative derivative. Yeah. I call these saddle points, because you can kind of sit here like you're riding a little horse or something. Yeah. So let's use that and revisit our previous example. In the previous example, let's remember our sign chart. Um, we had our sign chart 0 to 2 pi, 5 over 3 pi, 5 pi over 3, positive, negative, positive, negative. So here's our sign chart. Let's use our sign chart now to classify the local extrema. Classify the local extrema. So visually, what's going to happen? At pi, at pi over 3, that was a critical point. The function goes from increasing to decreasing. So visually, the function looks something like this, right? <laughs> visually, what does the function look like at pi? It goes from decreasing to increasing. Visually, at 5 pi over 3, it goes from increasing to decreasing. And so this tells us what the function's doing. At x equals pi over 3, we have a local max. Because the function, or the derivative function, goes from um, positive to negative. At x equals pi, we have a local min. And at x equals 5 pi over 3, we have a local max again. And that's kind of nice. Easy peasy. So whenever you're already around in the business of finding local mins and local maxes, right, you can go ahead and classify your local extrema and determine whether or not they're local mins or local maxes. So increasing or decreasing, you're already around to find, uh, to classify the local extrema. All right. Let's do another example. Suppose f of x is continuous and f prime of x is graphed below. Okay, so the function I'm about to draw is the derivative of f of x. So let's draw f prime of x. And this is the derivative. Remember, the y values of the function I'm about to draw give you the slopes of the original function, okay, or slopes of tangent lines of the original function. So here's the point 1, 2, 3, 4. Yeah. And suppose it looks something like this. Remember, these are the derivatives. Find the intervals on which f of x is increasing. Find the intervals on which f of x is decreasing. Find all critical points. Find the x-coordinates of any local mins. Spelling is hard. And find the x-coordinates of any local maxes. Okay. Pause the video. See if you can figure this out yourself. It really helps to make that sign chart and use the graph to fill in the values, OK? Give it a shot. All right, so let's make our sign chart together. I know that I'm going to start at 0, 
and I go on and on forever. What do I plot? I plot the values at which the derivative is zero or does not exist, right? That's what I plot on my sign charts. I plot where you have your roots or, the, or, or where the function doesn't exist or is undefined. That occurs at one, two, three, four. Okay. What are the values of the derivative between zero and one? Are they positive or negative? They're positive because the y values of the derivative are above the x-axis, right? The, the y values of the derivative between 1 and 2 are also positive. The y values of the derivative from 2 to 3 are negative. They're positive from 3 to 4. And they're negative after 4. Yeah? So visually, what does it look like? From one to, from, uh, at 1, I know it goes from an increasing function, flattens out, and starts increasing again. That's your saddle point, right? I know that at 2, it goes from increasing to decreasing. At 3, it goes from decreasing back to increasing. And at 4, it goes from increasing back to decreasing. Yeah. And these little pictures help, help me classify anyway. So let's fill in the gaps. Where are my critical points? Well, that's what we plot on a number line. That's at x equals 1, 2, 3, 4. What are the intervals on which we're decrease on or increasing? Let's do increasing first. And remember, this is an, a continuous function, so we can include the endpoints. We're increasing on the closed interval from 0 to 1, and then the closed interval from 1 to 2, right? OK and then the closed interval from 3 to 4. But what's really the interval, this first interval? This first interval should really be from 0 to 2. Does that make sense? So instead of this, really we're increasing on the entire interval from 0 to 2, because we can include those endpoints. Okay. Where are we decreasing? We're decreasing from 2 to 3, and then from 4 onward to infinity. Where do I have a local min? I have a local minimum only where I switch from decreasing back to increasing, which is at x equals 3, and I have a local maximum at x equals 2 and x equals 4. So let's put this to practice. Let's do a little application question. Hopefully this fills in the gaps of who cares about all of this stuff. Example. Suppose a farmer. Wants to build a fence. In the shape of a rectangle. a rectangular pin, I guess. He wants to build a rectangular pin surrounded by a fence that will be bounded on one side by a barn and on the other three sides by a fence. If he has 800 meters of fencing material, or not meters, 800, we'll do feet, 800 feet of fencing material, what is the area of the largest possible pen? So if a farmer wants to build a rectangular pen bounded on one side by a barn and three sides by fencing. If we have 800 feet of fence, what's the largest, what's the area of the largest possible pen? So just like related rates, anytime you see a word problem, what's always step one? 
draw the picture. Always, always, always. So we start by drawing a barn. And here is my absolutely beautiful barn. Yeah. And I know that one of the walls is going to be the wall of my fence. Yeah. Because it says that it's bounded on one side by this barn. So I only need to draw the pin something like this. Yeah. And here's my little pin that I need. And the question is, what's the dimensions of this pin that maximize the area? Let's label the picture. Remember, this is always um, step one. Draw and label your picture. I can vary how far in this direction um, the fencing goes. So we'll call that variable y. And I can also vary how long this side length is as well. So. What's the total number or total amount of fencing I have? I have 800 feet of total fencing. Well, in my equation or in my uh, my variables here, what's the total amount of fencing? I have one side length with x. I have two side lengths with length y. And I know that the sum has to be 800 feet because that's my total allotment of fencing, right? What am I trying to do? I'm trying to find the largest possible area. Largest possible area. So the area of this pen that I've made, right, this enclosed area here, is x times y. So what can we do? How can we solve this problem? Well, I know that um, the x and y are related by this equation here. This is called our constraint equation. So We'll talk more about this next semester, but this is called our constraint equation, and this is limits of resources and things. So what we want to do is turn A, our area function, to a single variable problem. What's the easiest variable to solve for in this equation? Let's solve for x. x is equal to 800 minus 2y. And let's plug that in to our area equation. I have that the area is equal to, well, it's x, which is 800 minus 2y times y. Yeah? And there's the equation for area in terms of y. Let's differentiate now, or not differentiate, let's distribute y. We get 800y minus 2y squared. What do we want to do with this function? This is the area of any pin subject to this constraint. So as soon as you fix this value of y, this length is also determined, and this length is also determined, right? So we made it a one variable problem. How do we find maximum values and minimum values of functions? We take a derivative, right? But it turns out that this equation also gives us um, an interval. If we have a fence, what do we know about the minimum value of this length y? I know that y has to be always bigger than or equal to zero. Yeah? And we know that x has to be at least zero. Yeah? To have any fencing. But if x is at least zero, think about this equation here. What's the largest value that y can be to make sure that x is still positive? y has to be at most 400, uh, sorry, 200, uh, no, 400. Yeah? Yeah. y has to be at most uh, 400. I can't write. So we really need to find the maximum value of this function on the closed bounded interval from 0 to 400. We know how to do that. What do we do? We take a derivative now. We take a derivative. What's a prime? It's 800 minus 4y. Now I find critical points. What are my critical points? I set this equation equal to 0, and we solve for y. y has to therefore be 200. What do we do now? We make a list. Remember this? This is in our Extrema video. We're finding the 
largest value on a closed bounded interval, we find the critical point, and we make a list. We look at a at the first value of y, a at the critical point, and a at the other end point, 400. And the biggest is the biggest, and the smallest is the smallest, right? So what is the area if y is equal to 0? Well, plug in y equals 0 here. What do you get? Well, this is actually easier here, I guess. If you plug in y equals 0, this is 0. If y is 400, what is this value? What does this equation evaluate to? Well, 800 minus 2 times 400 is, again, 0. So now, what is going to be a of 200? Whatever this value is, we know it has to be the maximum, um, as long as it's not 0, I guess. And if you plug it in here, I think you get um, well, 8 minus 800 minus 400 is 400. 400 times 200 is 80,000. And our units are square feet. Okay. So extremes are super useful, especially if you're a farmer wanting to um, build a fence next to a barn. So I hope that this helps, guys. As always, if you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to reach out via email, and I'm happy to set up a time to Zoom. Um, and I look, I thank you so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.